Chapter Nineteen of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by francis jenkins olcott skilly wagon from cornwall everyone knows that before king arthur ruled in britain the danes conquered cornwall then many of the rich cornish folk buried their gold and treasures and fled to the land of wales a few years after that king arthur came with his knights and drove the danes out of cornwall then the folk came back, but never again could they find their buried treasures, and today none but the Spriggans know where the gold is hidden. Well, one morning not very long ago, Uncle Billy of Trevigida was out on the side of a hill, cutting away the firs that was as high as his head, with bare places here and there covered with white clover heath and whortleberries uncle billy was working hard when he spied the prettiest little creature a real little man not bigger than a kitten sleeping on a bank of wild thyme he was dressed in a green coat sky blue breeches and diamond buckled shoes his tiny cocked hat was drawn over his face to shade it from the sun uncle billy stooped and looked at him and longed to carry him home to his children for he had a houseful of little ones boys and girls so he took off his cuff and slipped it quickly over the spriggan for a spriggan it was that lay there before he could wake the little fellow opened his pretty eyes and said in a sleepy voice mommy where are you mommy daddy then he saw uncle billy looking at him who are you he said you're a fine great giant i want my mammy can you find her for me i do not know where she is answered uncle billy but come home with me and play with my children until your mammy finds you very well said the spriggan i love to ride goats over the rocks and to have milk and blackberries for supper will you give me some yes my son said uncle billy and with that he picked up the spriggan gently and carried him home well you should have seen the children they were so happy to own a spriggan they set the little fellow on the hearth and he played with them as if he had known them always uncle billy and his wife were delighted and the children shouted for joy when the pretty little man capered and jumped about they called him bobby spriggan twice a day they gave him a wee mug of milk and a few blackberries and now and then some haws for a change in the mornings while uncle billy's wife and the children were doing the housework bobby spriggan sat perched on the faggots in the wood corner and sang and chirped away like a robin redbreast when the hearth was swept and the kitchen made tidy and uncle billy's wife was knitting bobby would dance for hours on the hearthstone the faster her needles clicked the faster he danced and spun around and around and the children laughed and clapped their hands and danced with him a week or so after bobby spriggan had been found uncle billy had to leave home as he wished to keep the little fellow safe and sound until he told where the crocks of cornish gold were hidden uncle billy shut him up with the youngest children in the barn and put a strong padlock on the door now stay in the barn and play called uncle billy to the children and don't try to get out or when i come home you'll get a whopping said he and then went away the children laughed a part of the time and part of the time they cried 
for they did not like being locked in the barn. But Bobby Spriggum was as merry as a cricket. He danced and sang and peeped through the cracks in the wall at the men who were working in the fields. And when the men went to dinner, up jumped Bobby and unbarred a window. "'Come along, children,' he cried. "'Now for a game of hide-and-seek in the furs.' Then he sprang out the window, and the children followed after, and away they all ran to play in the furs. They were shouting and throwing whortleberries about, when suddenly they saw a little man and woman, no bigger than Bobby. The little man was dressed like Bobby, except that he wore high riding boots with silver spurs. The little woman's green gown was spangled with glittering stars. Diamond shoe buckles shone on her high-heeled shoes, and her tiny steeple-crowned hat was perched on a pile of golden curls, wreathed with heath blossoms. The pretty little soul was weeping and wringing her hands and crying, Oh, my tender skilly wiggin, where canst thou be? Shall I never set eyes on thee again, my only one, my only joy? Go back, go back, cried Bobby Spriggum to the children. Then he called out, Here I am, Mommy. And just as he said, Here I am, the little man and the little woman and Bobby Spriggum himself who was their precious skillywiggin, vanished, and were seen no more. And the children cried and cried and went home. And when Uncle Billy came back, you might be sure that he whipped them all soundly. And it served them right, for if they had minded and stayed in the barn, Bobby Spriggum would have shown Uncle Billy where the Cornish gold was hidden. End of chapter 19. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 20 of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott. The Leprechaun or Fairy Shoemaker Stranger Little cowboy, what have you heard? Up on the lonely rass green mound. Little cowboy Only the plaintive yellow bird Sighing in sultry fields around. Cherry, cherry, cherry chee only the grasshopper and the bee fairy shoemaker singing underground tip tap tip rap tick attack too scarlet leather sewn together this will make a shoe left right pull it tight summer days are warm underground in winter laughing at the storm stranger Lay your ear close to the hill. Do you not catch the tiny clamor? Busy click of an elfin hammer? Voice of the leprechaun singing shrill. As he merrily plies his trade? He's a span and a quarter in height. Get him in sight, hold him tight, and you're a made man. You watch your cattle the summer day, sup on potatoes, sleep in the hay. How would you like to roll in your carriage? Look for a duchess's daughter in marriage. Seize the shoemaker, then you may. Fairy Shoemaker, singing underground. Big boots a-hunting, sandals in the hall. White for a wedding feast, pink for a ball this way that way so we make a shoe 
getting rich every stitch tick attack two stranger nine and ninety treasure crocks this keen mr fairy hath hid in mountains woods and rocks ruin and round tower cave and wrath and where the cormants build from times of old guarded by him each of them filled full to the brim with gold i caught him at work one day myself in the castle ditch where foxglove grows a wrinkled wizened and bearded elf spectacles stuck on his pointed nose silver buckles to his hose leather apron shoe in his lap fairy shoemaker singing underground rip rap tip tap tick attack too a grasshopper on my cap away the moth flew buskins for a fairy prince rogues for his son pay me well pay me well when the job is done stranger the rogue was mine beyond a doubt i stared at him he stared at me servant sir humph says he and pulled a snuff-box out he took a long pinch looked better pleased the queer little leprechaun offered the box with a whimsical grace poof he flung the dust in my face and while i sneezed was gone william allingham end of chapter twenty recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter number twenty one of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud by francis jenkins olcott glad little sad little bad little elves saint francis and saint benedict bless this house from wicked weight from the nightmare and the goblin that is height good fellow robin keep it from all evil spirits fairies weasels rats and ferrets from curfew time to the next prime william cartwright end of chapter twenty one recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter twenty two of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by carolyn lilliard the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud by francis jenkins olcott chapter twenty two little red cap from ireland sure and it was in old ireland some years ago that tom coglin returned one evening to his house expecting to find the fire blazing the potatoes boiling and his wife and children as merry as griggs but instead the fire was out his wife was scolding and the children were all crying from hunger poor tom was quite astonished to find matters going on so badly for though there was a plenty of potatoes in the house there wasn't a single stick of wood for the fire something had to be done and tom bethought himself of the great firs bushes that grew around the ruins of the old fort on top of the nearby hill so he snatched up his axe and away he went before he reached the top of the hill the sun had gone down and the moon had risen and was shedding her wavering watery light on the ruins of the old fort 
the breeze rustled the dark firs bushes with an eerie sound and tom shivered with dread but he braced up his heart and approaching the fort raised his axe to cut down a big bush just then near him he heard the shriek of a small shrill voice tom startled let the axe fall from his grasp and looking up saw perched on the furze bush in front of him a little old man not more than a foot and a half high he wore a red cap his face was the color of a withered mushroom while his sparkling eyes twinkling like diamonds in the dark illuminated his distorted face his thin legs dangled from his fat round body ho ho said the little red cap is that what you're after tom coglin what did me and mine ever do to you that you should cut down our bushes why them nothing at all your honor said tom recovering a bit from his fright nothing at all only the children were crying from hunger and i thought i'd make bold to cut a bush or two to boil the potatoes for we haven't a stick in the house you mustn't cut down these bushes tom said the little red cap but as you are an honest man i'll buy them from you though i have a better right to them than you have so if you'll take my advice carry this mill home with you and let the bushes alone said the little red cap holding out a tiny stone mill for grinding meal mill indeed said tom looking with astonishment at the thing which was so small that he could have put it with ease into his breeches pocket mill indeed and what good will a bit of a thing like that do me sure it won't boil the potatoes for the children what good will it do you said the small red cap i'll tell you what good it will do you it will make you and your family as fat and strong as so many stall-fed bullocks and if it won't boil the potatoes it will do a great deal better for you have only to grind it and it will give you the greatest plenty of elegant meal but if you ever sell any of the meal that moment the mill will lose its power it's a bargain said tom so give me the mill and you're heartily welcome to the bushes there it is for you tom said the little red cap throwing the mill down to him there it is for you and much good may it do you but remember you are not to sell the meal on any account let me alone for that said tom and then he made the best of his way home where his wife was trying to comfort the children wondering all the time what in the world was keeping tom and when she saw him return without so much as one stick of wood to boil the potatoes her anger burst out but tom soon quieted her by placing the mill on the table and telling her how he had got it from the little red cap we'll try it directly said she and they pulled the table into the middle of the floor and commenced grinding away with the mill before long a stream of beautiful meal began pouring from it and in a short time they had filled every dish and pail in the house tom's wife was delighted as you may believe and the children managed the best they could for that night by eating plenty of raw meal well after that everything went very well with tom and his family the mill gave them all the meal they wanted and they grew as fat and sleek as coach horses but one morning when tom was away from home his wife needed money so she took a few pecks of the meal to town and sold it in the market and sorry enough she was for that night when tom came home and began to grind the mill not a speck of meal would come from it he could not for the life of him find out the reason for his wife was afraid to tell him about her selling the meal sure and that little old fellow cheated me well thought tom as mad as a nest of hornets so he put his axe under his arm and away he went to the old fort determined to punish the little red cap by cutting down his bushes but scarcely had he lifted his axe when the little red cap appeared and mighty angry he was too that tom should come cutting his bushes 
after having made a fair bargain with him you deceitful little ugly vagabond cried tom flourishing his axe to give me a meal that wasn't worth a sixpence if you don't give me a good one for it i'll cut down every bush what a blusterer you are tom said the little red cap but you'd better be easy and let the bushes alone or maybe you'll pay for it deceive you indeed didn't i tell you that mill would lose its power if you sold any of the meal and sure and i didn't either said tom well it's all one for that answered the little red cap for if you didn't your wife did and as to giving you another mill it's out of the question for the one i gave you was the only one in the fort and a hard battle we had to get it away from another party of the good people but i'll tell you what i'll do with you tom let the bushes alone and i'll make a doctor of you a doctor indeed said tom maybe it's a fool you're making of me but it was no such thing for the little red cap gave tom coglin a charm so that he could cure any sick person and tom took it home and became a great man with a very full purse he gave good schooling to his children one of them he made a grand butter merchant in the city of cork and the youngest son being ever and always a well-spoken lad he made a lawyer and his two daughters married well and tom is as happy as a man can be end of chapter twenty two chapter number twenty three of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud by francis jenkins olcott the curmudgeon's skin from ireland it is well known in old ireland that a four-leaf shamrock has the power to open a man's eyes so that he can see all kinds of enchantments and this is what happened to billy thompson one misfortune after another decreased his goods his sheep died and his pig got the measles so that he was obliged to sell it for little or nothing but he still had his cow well said billy to his wife for he was a good-humoured fellow and always made the best of things well he said it can't be helped anyhow we'll not want the drop of milk to our potatoes as long as the cows left to comfort us the words were hardly out of his mouth when a neighbor came running up to tell him that his cow had fallen from a cliff and was lying dead in the horse's glen for billy you must know had sent his cow that very morning to graze on the cliff oh all gone said billy what will we do now oh you cruel unnatural beef as to cliff yourself when you knowed as well as myself that we couldn't do without you at all for sure enough now the children will be crying for the drop of milk to their potatoes such was billy's lament as with a sorrowful heart he made the best of his way to the horse's glen anyway thought he i'll skin the carcass and the meat will make fine broth for the children it took him some time to find where the poor beast was lying but at last he did find her all smashed to pieces at the foot of a big rock and he began to skin her as fast as he could but having no one to help him by the time the job was finished the sun had gone down now billy was so intent on his work that he did not perceive the lapse of time but when he raised his head and saw the darkness coming on and listened to the murmuring wind all the tales he had ever heard of the puka the banshee and little red cap the mischievous fairy floated through his mind 
and made him want to get home as fast as possible. He snatched a tuft of grass, wiped his knife, and seized hold of the hide. It so happened that in the little tuft of grass with which Billy wiped his knife was a four-leafed shamrock, and whether from grief or fear, Billy, instead of throwing away the grass, put it in his pocket along with his knife and when he stood up and turned to take a last look at the carcass he saw instead of his poor cow a little old curmudgeon sitting bolt upright looking as if he had just been skinned alive billy thompson billy thompson cried the little old fellow in a shrill squeaking voice you spalpeen you'd better come back with my skin a pretty time of day we've come to when a gentleman like me cannot take a bit of sleep but a rude fellow must come and strip the hide off him but you'd better bring it back billy thompson or i'll make you remember how you dared to skid me you spalpeen now billy though he was greatly frightened remembered that he had a black-handled knife in his pocket and whoever has that tis said can look all the fairies of the world in the face without quaking so he put his hand on the knife and began backing away with the skin under his arm why then your honor said he if it's this skin you're wanting you must know it's the skin of my poor cow that was cliffed yonder there and sore and sorrowful the children will be for the want of her little drop of milk why then if that's what you'd be after billy my boy said the little fellow at the same time jumping before him with the speed of a greyhound do you think i'm such a fool as to let you walk off with my skin if you don't drop it in the turn of a hand you'll sup sorrow nonsense said billy drawing out his black-handled knife and holding it so the little man could see it never a one of me will let you have this skin till you give me back my cow i know well enough she was not cliffed at all at all and that you and the other curmudgeons have got hold of her you'd better keep a civil tongue in your head said the little fellow who seemed to get quite soft at the sight of the knife but you're a brave boy billy thompson and i've taken a fancy to you i don't say but i might get you your cow again if you give me back my skin thank you kindly said billy winking slyly give me the cow first then i will well there she is for you you unbelieving hound said the little curmudgeon and for sure and for certain what did billy thompson hear but his own cow bellowing behind him for the bare life and when he looked back and what should he see but his cow running over rocks and stones with a long rope hanging to one of her legs and four little fellows with red caps on them hunting her as fast as they could there'll be a battle for her billy there'll be a battle laughed the little curmudgeon and sure enough the little red cats began to fight and in the meantime the cow finding herself at liberty ran towards billy who lost not a minute but throwing the skin on the ground seized the cow by the tail and began to drive her away not so fast billy said the little curmudgeon who stuck close by his side not so fast though i gave you the cow i didn't give you the rope that's hanging to her leg a bargain's a bargain said billy so as i've got it i'll keep rope and all if you say that again said the little fellow i'll be after calling the red caps that are fighting below there but i don't want to be too hard on you billy 
for if you have a mind for the rope i'll give it to you for the little tuft of grass you have in your pocket there take it said billy throwing down the grass with the four-leaf shamrock in it no sooner was it out of his hand than he received such a blow that it dashed him to the ground insensible when he came to himself the sun was shining and where should he be but near his own house with the cow grazing beside him billy thompson could hardly believe his eyes and thought it was all a dream till he saw the rope hanging to his cow's leg and that was a lucky rope for him for from that day out his cow gave more milk than any six cows in the parish and billy began to look up in the world he took farms and purchased cattle till he became very rich but no one could ever get him to go to the horse's glen and to-day he never passes an old fort or hears a blast of wind without taking off his hat in compliment to the good people and tis only right that he should end of chapter twenty three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter twenty four of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by carolyn lilliard the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud by francis jenkins olcott chapter twenty four judy and the fairy cat from ireland late one halloween an old woman was sitting up spinning there came a soft knock at the door who's there asked she there was no answer but another knock who's there she asked a second time still no answer but a third knock at that the old woman got up in anger who's there she cried a small voice like a child's sobbed ah oh, judy dear let me in i'm so cold and hungry open the door judy dear and let me sit by the fire and dry myself judy dear let me in oh let me in judy thinking that it must be a small child who had lost its way ran to the door and opened it in walked a large black cat waving her tail and two black kittens followed her they walked deliberately across the floor and sat down before the fire and began to warm themselves and lick their fur, purring all the time. Judy never said a word, but closed the door and went back to her spinning. At last the black cat spoke. "'Judy, dear,' said she, "'do not sit up so late. This is the fairies' holiday, and they wish to hold a council in your kitchen and eat their supper here.' They are very angry because you are still up and they cannot come in. Indeed, Judy, they are determined to kill you. Only for myself and my two daughters, you would now be dead. So take my advice and do not interfere with the fairies' Halloween. But give me some milk, for I must be off. Well, Judy got up in a great fright and ran as fast as she could and brought three saucers full of milk and set them on the floor before the cats. They lapped up all the milk. Then the black cat called her daughters and stood up. Thank you, Judy, dear, she said. You have been very civil to me and I'll not forget. Good night, good night. And with that, she and her kittens whisked up the chimney and were gone. Then Judy saw something shining on the hearth. She picked it up. It was a piece of silver money, more than she could earn in a month. She put out the light and went to bed, and never again did she sit up late on Halloween and interfere with fairy hours. End of chapter 24 
Chapter twenty five of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carolyn Lilliard. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott. Chapter twenty five The Bogart from Yorkshire once upon a time a bogart lived in a farmer's house he was a mischievous elf and specially fond of teasing the children when they were eating their supper he would make himself invisible and standing back of their chairs would snatch away their bread and butter and drain their mugs of milk on cold nights he would pull the cloths from their warm beds and tickle their feet and the children liked to tease the bogart in return there was a closet in the kitchen with a large knot-hole in its wall behind which the bogart lived the children used to stick a shoehorn into the hole and the bogart would throw it back at them the shoehorn made the little man so angry that one day he threw it at the youngest boy's head and hurt him badly at length the bogart became such a torment that the farmer and his wife decided to move to another place and let the mischievous creature have their house to himself the day of the moving came all the furniture was piled into a wagon and a neighbor called to say good-bye so farmer said he you are leaving the old house at last hey ho sighed the farmer i am forced to do it that villain bogart torments us so that we have no rest night or day he almost killed my youngest boy so you see we are forced to flit scarcely were the words out of his mouth when a squeaky voice cried from the bottom of the churn that was in the wagon eh eh we're flitting you see odds hang it cried the poor farmer there is that villain bogart again if he's going along with us i shall not stir a peg nay nay it's no use molly said he turning to his wife we may as well stay here in the old house as to be tormented in the new one that is not so convenient and they stayed end of chapter twenty five Chapter Twenty Six of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carolyn Lilliard. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott. Own Self from Northumberland. Once upon a time there was a widow and her little boy. Their home was a small cottage in the wood. The mother worked hard from early morning until evening, and she was so tired that she liked to go to bed early. But the little boy did not like to go to bed early at all. One evening when his mother told him to undress, he begged her, saying, I'm not sleepy. May I sit up just this once? very well said she sit up if you wish but if the fairies catch you here alone they will surely carry you off then she went to bed the little boy laughed and sat down on the hearth before the fire watching the blaze and warming his hands by and by he heard a giggling and a laughing in the chimney and the next minute he saw a tiny girl as big as a doll, come tumbling down and jump onto the hearth in front of him. At first the little boy was dreadfully frightened, but the tiny girl began to dance so prettily and to nod her head at him in such a friendly way that he forgot to be afraid. "'What do they call you, little girl?' said he. "'My name is Own Self,' said she proudly. "'What is yours?' my name he answered laughing very hard is my own self 
then the two children began to play together as if they had known each other all their lives they danced and they sang and they roasted chestnuts before the fire and they tickled the house cat's ears then the fire commenced to flicker and it grew dimmer and dimmer so the little boy took the poker and stirred up the embers and a hot coal tumbled out and rolled onto own self tiny foot and oh how she screamed then she wept and flew into such a rage that the little boy got frightened and hid behind the door just then a squeaky voice called down the chimney own self own self what wicked creature hurt you my own self my own self she screamed back then come here you troublesome little fairy cried the voice angrily and a fairy mother slipper in hand came hurrying down the chimney and catching own self she whipped her soundly and carried her off saying what's all this noise about then if you did it your own self there's nobody to blame but yourself end of chapter 26、Chapter 27 The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott. The Sick Bed Elves from China. Wang Little Third One lay stretched on his bed of bamboo laths, where a low fever kept him. He complained to everyone, especially to his friend the magician, who came to see him. The magician was very wise, so he gave Wang a drink of something delicious and cool. And went away. When little third one had drunk this, his fever fell, and he was able to enjoy a little sleep. He was awakened by a slight noise. The night was come. The room was lighted by the full moon, which threw a bright gleam through the open door. Then he saw that the room was full of insects that were moving and flying hither and thither. There were white ants that gnaw wood, bat smelling bugs. Enormous cockroaches, mosquitoes, and many, many flies. And they were all buzzing, gnashing their teeth, or falling. As little third one looked, he saw something move on the threshold. A small man, not bigger than a thumb, advanced with cautious steps. In his hand he held a bow, a sword was hanging by his side. Little third one, looking closer, saw two dogs as big as shirt buttons running in front of the little man. They suddenly stopped. The archer approached nearer to the bed and held out his bow and discharged a tiny arrow. A cockroach that was crawling before the dogs made a bound, fell on its back, kicked, and was motionless. The arrow had run through it. Behind the little man, other little men had come. Some rode on small horses and were armed with swords, and still others were on foot. All these huntsmen scattered about the room and ran or rode to and fro, shooting arrows and brandishing their swords until hundreds and hundreds of insects were killed. At first, the mosquitoes escaped, but as they cannot fly for long, every time one of them settled on a wall, it was transfixed by a huntsman. Soon, none were left of all the insects that had broken the silence with their buzzing, their gnashing of teeth, and their falling. A horseman then galloped around the room, looking from right to left. He gave a signal. All the huntsmen called their dogs, went to the door, and disappeared. Little third one had not moved, for fear that he should disturb the hunt. At last he went peacefully to sleep and woke the next day, cured. When his friend the magician came to see him, little third one told him about the mysterious huntsman, and his friend the magician smiled. End of chapter twenty seven.
Chapter 28 of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annalisa Bodker. The Book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud by francis jenkins alcott chapter twenty eight how peeping kate was pisky led from cornwall tis halloween night teddy my boy don't go out on the moor or near the gump for the piskies and the spriggans are abroad waiting to mislead straying mortals. Many are the men and women that the little people have whisked away on Halloween night, and the poor mortals have never been heard of since. Sit down, Teddy, my boy, crack these nuts and eat these red apples, and I'll tell you how Peeping Kate was pisky led. I have heard the old folks say how long ago maybe a hundred years or so the squire of pendine had a housekeeper an elderly dame called kate tregear well one halloween night some spices and other small things were wanted for the feast and tide and kate would not trust any one to go for them except herself so she put on her red coat and high steepled crowned hat and walked to penzance she bought the goods and started for home it was a bright moonlight night and though no wind was blowing the leaves of the trees were murmuring with a hollow sound and kate could hear strange rustlings in the bushes by the side of the road she had walked a very long time and her basket was so heavy that she began to feel tired her legs bent under her, and she could scarcely stand up. Just then she beheld, a little in front of her, a man on horseback, and she could tell by the proud way he sat that he was a gentleman born. She was very glad to see him, and as he was going slowly she soon overtook him, and when she came up his horse stood stock still my dear master she said how glad i am to see you don't you know me i'm kate tregear of pendine and i can't tell you how hard i've worked all day then she explained to him how she had walked to penzance and was now so tired that she could not stand up but the gentleman made no reply my dear master said she I'm footsore and leg weary. I've got as far as here, you see, but I can get no farther. Do have pity on a poor, unfortunate woman and take her behind you. I can ride well enough on your horse's back without a saddle or pillion. But still the gentleman made no reply. My dear master, she said again, my but you're a fine-looking man. How upright you sit on your horse. But why don't you answer me? Are you asleep? One would think you were taking a nap, and your horse, too. It is standing so still. Not having any word in reply to this fine speech, Kate called out as loud as she could, Even if you are a gentleman born, you needn't be so stuck up that you won't speak to a poor body afoot. Still he never spoke, though Kate thought she saw him wink at her. This vexed her the more. The time was when the Tregeers were among the first in the parish and were buried with the gentry. Wake up and speak to me, screamed she in a rage, and then she took up a stone and threw it at the horse. The stone rolled back to her feet and the animal did not even whisk its tail. Kate now got nearer, and saw that the rider had no hat on, 
nor was there any hair on his bald head. She touched the horse and felt nothing but a bunch of furs. She rubbed her eyes and saw at once, to her great astonishment, that it was no gentleman and horse at all, only a smooth stone half buried in a heap of furs. And there she was, still far away from Pendine, with her heavy basket and her legs so tired that she could scarcely move. And then she saw that she had come a short distance only, and knew that she must be bewitched. Well, on she went, and seeing a light at her left hand, she thought that it shone from the window of a house where she might rest a while. So she made for it straight across the moor, floundering through bogs, and tripping over bunches of firs, and still the light was always just ahead, and it seemed to move from side to side. Then suddenly it went out, and she was left standing in a bog. The next minute she found herself among firs ricks and pigsties in the yard of Farmer Boslow, miles away from Pendine. She opened the door of an old outhouse and entered, hoping to get a few hours' rest. There she lay down on straw and fell asleep, but she was soon wakened by some young pigs who were rooting around in the straw. That was too much for Kate, so up she got, and as she did so she heard the noise of a flail, and seeing a glimmer of light in a barn nearby, she crept softly to a little window in the barn and peeped to see what was going on. At first she could see only two rush wicks burning in two old iron lamps. Then, through the dim light, she saw the slash-flash of a flail as it rose and fell and beat the barn floor. She stood on tiptoes and stuck her head in farther, and whom did she see, wielding the flail, but a little old man, about three feet high, with hair like a bunch of rushes and ragged clothes. His face was broader than it was long, and he had great owl eyes shaded by heavy eyebrows from which his nose poked like a pig's snout. Kate noticed that his teeth were crooked and jagged, and that at each stroke of the flail he kept moving his thin lips around and around and thrusting his tongue in and out. His shoulders were broad enough for a man twice his height, and his feet were splayed like a frog's. Well, well, thought Kate, this is luck to see the pisky thrashing. For ever since I can remember, I have heard it said that the pisky threshed corn for Farmer Boslow on winter nights and did other odd jobs for him the year round but I would not believe it, yet here he is. Then she reached her head farther in and beheld a score of little men helping the pisky. Some of them were lugging down the sheaves and placing them handy for him, and others were carrying away the straw from which the grain had been threshed. Soon a heap of corn was gathered on the floor, as clean as if it had been winnowed, in doing this, the pisky raised such a dust that it set him and some of the little men sneezing, and Kate, without stopping to think, called out, God bless you, little men! Quick as a wink, the lights vanished, and a handful of dust was thrown into her eyes, which blinded her so that for a moment she could not see, and then she heard the pisky squeak, I spy thy face, old peeping Kate, I'll serve thee out early and late. Kate, when she heard this, felt very uneasy, for she remembered that the little people have a great spite against anyone who peeps at them or pries into their doings. The night being clear, she quickly found her way out of a crooked lane and ran as fast as she could and never stopped until she reached the gump. There she sat down to rest a while. After that she stood up, and turned, whichever way she might, the same road lay before her. 
then she knew that the piskey was playing her a trick so she ran down a hill as fast as she could not caring in what direction she was going so long as she could get away from the piskey after running a long while she heard music and saw lights at no great distance thinking that she must be near a house she went over the downs towards the lights feeling ready for a jig and stopping now and then to dance around and around to the strains of the music but instead of arriving at a house in passing around some high rocks she came out on a broad green meadow encircled with firs and rocks and there before her she saw a whole troop of spriggans holding an elfin fair it was like a feast and day scores of little booths were standing in rows and were covered with tiny trinkets such as buckles of silver and gold glistening with cornish diamonds pins with jewelled heads brooches rings bracelets and necklaces of crystal beads green and red or blue and gold and many other pretty things new to kate there were lights in all directions lanterns no bigger than foxgloves were hanging in rows and on the booths rushlights in tulip cups shone among fairy goodies such as kate had never dreamed of yet with all these lights there was such a shimmer over everything that she got bewildered and could not see as plainly as she wished she did not care to disturb the little people until she had looked at all that was doing so she crept softly behind the booths and watched the spriggans dancing hundreds of them linked hand in hand went whirling around so fast as to make her dizzy small as they were they were all decked out like rich folk the little men in cocked hats and feathers blue coats gay with lace and gold buttons breeches and stockings of lighter hue and tiny shoes with diamond buckles kate could not name the colors of the little ladies dresses which were of all the hues of summer blossoms the vain little things had powdered their hair and decked their heads with ribbons feathers and flowers their shoes were of velvet and satin and were high-heeled and pointed and such sparkling black eyes as all the little ladies had and such dimpled cheeks and chins and they were merry sprightly and laughing all the spriggans were capering and dancing around a pole wreathed with flowers the pipers standing in their midst played such lively airs that kate never in all her life had wanted to dance more but she kept quite still for she did not wish the little people to know that she was there she was determined to pocket some of the pretty things in the booths and steal softly away with them she thought how nice a bright pair of diamond buckles would look on her best shoes and how fine her sunday cap would be ornamented with a fairy brooch so she raised her hand and laid it on some buckles when oh oh she felt a palm full of pins and needles stick into her fingers like red-hot points and she screamed misfortune take you you bad little spriggans immediately the lights went out and she felt hundreds of the little people leap on her back and her neck and her head at the same moment others tripped up her heels and laid her flat on the ground and rolled her over and over then she caught sight of the piskey mounted on a wild-looking colt his toes stuck in its mane he was holding a rush for a whip and there he sat grinning from ear to ear and urging on the spriggans to torment her with ha 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 and tee he he she spread out her arms and squeezed herself tight to the ground so that the spriggans might not turn her over but they squeaked and grunted and over and over she went and every time that they turned her face downward some of the little fellows jumped on her back and jigged away from her toe to her head she reached around to beat them off with a stick but they pulled it out of her hand 
and balancing it across her body, strided it and bobbed up and down, singing, See saw pate, lie still, O oh peeping Kate. See saw pate, here we'll ride early and late on the back of peeping Kate. And with that, poor Kate, not to be beaten by the spriggans, tossed back her feet to kick the little fellows away, but they pulled off her shoes and tickled and prickled the soles of her feet till she fell a laughing and a crying by turns. Kate was almost mad with their torment when by good chance she remembered a charm that would drive away all mischievous spirits on Halloween. So she repeated it forwards and backwards, and in a twinkling all the little spriggans fled screeching away, the pisky galloping after them. Then she got to her feet and looked around. She saw by the starlight of a clear frosty morning that the place to which she had been pisky-led was a green spot near the gump, where folk said the spriggans held their nightly revels, and although the spot was very small, it had seemed to her like a ten-acre field because of enchantment. And her hat and her shoes and her basket were gone, and poor Kate, barefooted and bareheaded, had to hobble home as best she could, and she reached Pendine Gate more dead than alive. End of chapter 28 How Peeping Kate Was Pisky Led Recording by Annalisa Bodker Chapter 29 of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott. Chapter 29 One Eyed Prying Jones' Tale from Cornwall. Sit down, Bobby, my boy. Eat some bread and cheese. Don't be afraid to drink the cider. It's all my own making. Sit down, and I'll tell you how I lost the sight of my right eye. The last Christmas Eve I went to Penzance to buy a pair of shoes for myself, and some thread and buttons, and things to mend master's clothes. I dearly like company, and as I started out I thought of old Betty down at the cove. She, that they say, is a witch, you know. Thinks I to myself, if she's a witch, she'll not hurt me, as I never crossed her in my life. Witch or no witch, I'll stop and have a bite of something hot at her little house, thought I. When I came to the house, the door was tight shut, and I heard a strange mumbling inside, but I could not make out what it was. So I took a peep through the latch hole, and what did I see but old Betty standing by the chimney piece with a little box in her hand? and she was muttering something that sounded like a charm. She put her finger into the box and pulled it out again, and smeared some ointment over her eyes. Then she put the box into a hole near the chimney. I lifted the latch and walked in. How do you do, Betty? said I. Welcome, said she, grinning and pleased. Sit down by the fire. Now we'll have a good drop of something hot to ourselves, seeing that it's Christmas Eve, said she. I'll take a thimbleful, just to drink your health, and a Merry Christmas to you with all my heart, said I, for I well knew that Betty made the best sweet drink, with sugar and spice and a roasted apple bobbing around in it. I put down my basket and took off my coat and sat by the fire, while Betty stepped into a closet to fetch the cups. Now, I had often wondered what made her eyes so clear and piercing. "'Tis the fairy ointment, or witch salve, in the box,' thought I. "'If it will do that to her eyes, it won't hurt me.' So while she was gone, I took the box from the hole where she had covered it with ferns, and put a bit of the ointment on my right eye. The stuff had no sooner touched me than it burned like fire, or as if needles and pins were being thrust into my eyeball. Just then, Betty came from the closet, and I dragged the brim of my hat down over my right eye, so she should not see what had happened. 
after we had drunk each other's health three or four times the pain went off and i ventured to open my anointed eye and oh what did i see the place was full of spriggans troops of the little people were cutting all sorts of capers in the folds of the nets and sails hung on the walls in the bunches of herbs that sung from the rafters and in the pots and pans on the dresser some of them were playing seesaw in the beams of the ceiling tossing their heels and waving their feathered caps as they teetered up and down on bits of straw or green twigs members of them were swinging in the cobwebs that festooned the rafters or riding mice in and out through holes in the thatch i noted that all the little men were dressed in green tricked out with red and had feathered caps and high riding boots with silver spurs their ladies if you please were all decked in grand fashion the gowns were of green velvet with long trains and looped up with silver chains and bells they wore high-crowned steeple hats with wreaths of the most beautiful flowers around them while sprigs of blossoms and garlands decorated all parts of their dress and were in their hands as well they were the sauciest little people i ever did see they pranced around on their high-heeled boots sparkling with diamond buckles when i peeped into the wood corner under betty's bunk i spied some of the ugly spriggans sitting there looking very gloomy because they have to watch the treasures that are hidden in the ground and do other disagreeable things that the merry spriggans never have to do while looking into the dark corner i heard strains of sweet unearthly music outside the house glancing around the room i saw that all was changed the walls were hung with tapestry the chimney stools on which we sat were carved chairs betty and i sat under a canopy of embroidered satin and our feet rested on a silken carpet and wherever the little spriggans trod they left circles like diamonds on the floor the sweet music was now close at hand under the little window and a moment after a troop of the little people appeared on the window sill playing on pipes flutes and other instruments made of green reeds from the brook and of shells from the shore the fairy band stepped down most gracefully from the window sill and was closely followed by a long train of little men and women magnificently dressed and carrying bunches of flowers in their hands all walked in an orderly procession two by two and bowed and curtsied to betty and cast the flowers in her lap i saw there many bunches of four-leaved clover and sprigs of magic herbs with these she makes the salves and lotions then all the spriggans who had been dancing and capering about the ceiling and floor joined the others and came crowding round betty she did not look surprised and i did not say anything to let her know that i saw the spriggans then began to pour dew over her dress out of flower buds and from the bottles of the foxglove immediately her jacket was changed into the finest and richest cloth of a soft cream colour and her dress became velvet the colour of all the flowers and it was draped over a petticoat of silk quilted with silver cord the little people brought tiny nosegays of sky-blue pimpernel forget-me-nots and dainty flower bells blue pink and white and hundreds of other fairy blossoms like stars and butterflies these delicate little sprigs they stitched all over betty's silver cord of petticoat together with branching moss and the lace-like tips of the wild grass all around the bottom of their skirt they made a wreath of tiny bramble leaves with roses and berries red and black many of the little people perched themselves on the top of the high-backed chair in which betty sat and even stood on her shoulders so that they might arrange her every curl and every hair some took the lids off pretty little urns they carried in their hands and poured perfume on her head which spread the sweetest odours through the room i very much admired the lovely little urns with their grooved lids but when i picked one up it was only a seed pot of the wild poppy they placed no other ornaments in her hair except a small twig of holly full of bright red berries yet betty decked out by her fairy friends was more beautiful than the loveliest queen of may my senses were overcome by the smell of the fairy odours and the scent of the flowers and the sweet perfume of honey with which the walls of the house seemed bursting and my head fell forward and i slept 
How long I dozed I do not know, but when I woke I saw that all the little spriggans were glaring at me angrily. They thrust out their tongues and made the most horrid grimaces. I was so frightened that I jumped up and ran out of the house and shut the door. But for the life of me I could not leave the place without taking another peep. I put my left eye to the latch hole, and would you believe it? The house was just as it was when I entered it. The floor was bare, and there sat Betty in her old clothes before the fire. Then I winked and looked with the right eye, and there was the beautiful room, and Betty seated in her fine flower gown, beneath the silken canopy, while all the little spriggans were dancing and capering around her. I tore myself away, glad to get out of the cove, and hurried to Penzance to do my shopping, although it was so late. And as I was standing in front of a booth, what should I see but a little spriggan helping himself to hanks of yarn, stockings, and all sorts of fine things? Aha, my little man, cried I, are you not ashamed to be carrying on this way, stealing all those goods? Is that thee, old Joan, said he, which I canst thou see me with? After winking both my eyes, I said, "'Tis plain enough that I can see you with my right eye. Then in a twinkling he pointed his finger at my right eye, and mumbled a spell, and I just caught the words, "'Joan de Pry shall nor peep nor spy, but shall lose her charmed eye.' Then he blew in my face and was gone, and when I looked around, my right eye was blind." And from that day to this, I have never seen a blink with my anointed eye. End of chapter 29. Recording by phone. Chapter 30 of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annalisa Bodker. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Alcott. Chapter 30 The Fairy Folk. Up the airy mountain, down the rushy glen, we daren't go a hunting for fear of little men we folk good folk trooping all together green jacket red cap and white owl's feather down along the rocky shore some make their home they live on crispy pancakes of yellow tide foam some in the reeds of the black mountain lake with frogs for their watch-dogs all night awake high on the hilltop the old king sits he is now so old and gray he's nigh lost his wits with a bridge of white mist columkill he crosses on his stately journeys from sleeve league to rosses or going up with music on cold starry nights to sup with the queen of the gay northern lights they stole little bridget for seven years long when she came down again her friends were all gone they took her lightly back between the night and morrow they thought that she was fast asleep but she was dead with sorrow they have kept her ever since deep within the lakes on a bed of flag leaves watching till she wakes by the craggy hillside, through the mosses bare, they have planted thorn trees for pleasure here and there. Is any man so daring as dig one up in spite? He shall find their sharpest thorns in his bed at night. Up the airy mountain, down the rushy glen, we daren't go a hunting for fear of little men. We folk, good folk trooping all together green jacket red cap and white owl's feather william allingham end of thirty the fairy folk recording by annalisa bodker
Chapter number thirty one of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott Fairy Servants in the House Their dwellings be in corners of old houses less frequented, or beneath stacks of wood and those convented. Make fearful noise in butteries and in dairies. Robin Goodfellows some, some call them fairies. In solitary rooms these uproars keep, and beat at doors to wake men from their sleep. Pots, glasses, trenchers, dishes, pans, and kettles, they will make dance about the shelves and settles as if about the kitchen tossed and cast, yet in the morning nothing found misplaced. From the Hierarchy of the Blessed Angels, 1635. End of chapter 31. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 32 of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. By Francis Jenkins Olcott, the fairy servants from Basque. Once upon a time, there was a poor woman who had three daughters. One day, the youngest said, "Mother, now that I am old enough, I wish to go out to service." The mother thought to herself, "If this one goes, why there will be more to eat for the rest of us." So she said. Very well, good luck, go with you. The girl set out, and after she had walked a long way, she came to a beautiful city. A handsome lady met her and asked, Where are you going, my child? I'm going out to service, replied the girl. Will you come with me to my home? asked the lady. Yes, indeed, said the girl, and I'll try to serve you faithfully. The lady led her to a large and fine house, and told her what work she should do that day. "'We are fairies,' said she. "'I must go away for a short time, but do you work in the kitchen while I am gone. Dig up the kitchen floor, smash the pitcher, break the plates, whip the children, throw dirt in their faces, and rumple their hair.' Then the lady went away. The girl, who thought these orders very strange, began to feed the children. Just then a little dog came creeping up to her, wagging his tail. Bow, 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 said he. I too want something to eat. So the girl gave him a plateful of breakfast, and when he had eaten all he wished, he said, You are a good girl and I will tell you what to do to please my mistress. What she really meant was for you to sweep the kitchen floor, fill the pitcher, wash the dishes, and dress and feed the children. Do all this well, and she will give you the choice of a beautiful star on your forehead or a donkey's tail hanging from your nose. Then she will offer you a sack of gold or a bag of charcoal. You must choose the donkey's tail and the bag of charcoal. Well, the girl did all as the little dog told her, and when the mistress came home she smiled and said, Choose which you will have, a beautiful star on your forehead 
or a donkey's tail hanging from your nose a donkey's tail is the same to me said the girl will you have a sack of gold or a bag of charcoal asked the lady the bag of charcoal is the same to me said the girl then the lady placed a beautiful star on her forehead and gave her a big sackful of gold and told her she might go back to her mother the girl thanked the lady and leaving the house hastened home when her mother and sister saw how pretty she was with the star on her forehead and when they felt the big sack of gold on her shoulder they were astonished then the eldest sister began to cry and said mother i will go out and be a servant too no no my child said the mother i will not let you go but the girl wept and would not leave her mother in peace until she said go then she set off and walked until she came to the fairy city the handsome lady met her and asked where are you going my child i am going out to service said the girl will you come with me to my home asked the lady the girl said she would so the lady led her to the large and fine house and told her what work she should do that day dig up the kitchen floor she said smash the pitcher break the plates whip the children throw dirt in their faces and rumple their hair then she went away as soon as the lady was gone the girl began to eat up all the good things in the pantry just then the little dog came creeping up to her wagging his tail bow 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 i too want something to eat he said go away you horrid little beast answered the girl and she gave him a kick but the little dog would not leave her and followed her about until she drove him from the kitchen with blows then she dug up the kitchen floor smashed the pitcher broke all the plates whipped the children threw dirt in their faces and rumpled their hair by and by the mistress came home and when she saw what the girl had been doing she frowned and said choose which you will have a beautiful star on your forehead or a donkey's tail hanging from your nose a star on my forehead for me said the girl will you have a sack of gold or a bag of charcoal asked the lady a sack of gold for me said the girl then the lady hung a donkey's tail on the end of her nose and gave her a big bag of charcoal and sent her back to her home and when her mother saw her she was so ashamed that she locked her in the cellar as for the youngest girl she shared her sack of gold with her mother and other sister and then she married a fine young man and lived happily ever after end of chapter 32 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc chapter 33 of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kirsten bradby the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud by francis jenkins alcott chapter 33 the pixies from england there was once a little cottage in the middle of a flower garden its walls were covered with roses and its porch was twined with clematis the bees buzzed over the flowers and the butterflies fluttered about the porch and a hundred little green pixies lived in the wood nearby in this cottage two orphan sisters dwelt all alone one morning the elder sister mary got up at break of day she milked the cow churned the butter swept the hearth and made the breakfast then she sat on the porch to spin and sang how merrily the wheel goes round with a whirring humming sound but the younger sister alice lay in bed asleep 
Then Mary put her spinning aside and called, "'Wake, Alice, wake! There is much for you to do while I go to the market town. I must sell our yarn and buy your new dress. While I am gone, don't forget to bring in the firewood, drain the honeycomb, and fill the pixie's water pail.' But Alice did not answer. So Mary put on her hood and took her basket full of yarn. She walked all the way to the market town and sold her yarn and bought the new dress. Then she walked home again. The sun was set when she reached the cottage, and Alice was sitting idle on the porch. The honeycomb was not drained, the firewood was not brought in, the bed was not made, and the supper was uncooked. And although Mary was tired and hungry, she had to cook the supper and make the bed. Then the sisters went to sleep. By and by, the hundred little green pixies came creeping, creeping into the kitchen. They pattered softly about and whispered so that the sisters should not hear them. Some ran to the spinning wheel and began to spin. Others built a fire under the oven and mixed and kneaded the bread. One took a broom and swept the floor, and another brought in the firewood. When all the yarn was spun, the bread baked and the kitchen tidy, the pixies ran to the water pail to get a drink. But there was not a drop of water in it, and oh, how angry they were! Then Mary awoke and cried, Alice, Alice, don't you hear those angry buzzings? Surely you did not forget to fill the pixie's water pail. But Alice answered, I did not draw the water today, and I will not leave my bed now to fetch it for any little pixie. Then she went to sleep again. But Mary got up, and though her feet were tired and sore, she took the pail and ran across the garden to the spring. And as she stooped, she saw a hundred little faces laughing at her from the water. She dipped her pail, and they were gone. She lifted the full pail, and felt little hands seize it and bear it along. It was carried to the door and into the kitchen, and set down by the hearth. But she could see no one, so she went to bed again. The next morning early, Mary got up. She ran to the pail and looked into it. Then she clapped her hands and called, "'Come, Alice, come!' See the silver pennies shining at the bottom of the clear water? There must be a hundred of them. Come, sister dear. Then Alice, waking, tried to sit up. But she screamed with fright, for she could not move her hands and feet. Indeed, she could not rise at all. And that day, and the next, and for many days after, she lay helpless on her bed, and Mary fed and comforted her. And every night... The hundred little green pixies came creeping, creeping into the kitchen. They swept, they baked, they sewed, they spun, and they drank from Mary's water pail. And every night they left one piece of silver there. And so a whole year passed, and Alice lay and thought and thought and thought about her idle ways. And one night she called Mary to her and wept and said, Oh, sister, if only I could get up tomorrow and feel the warm sunshine and play among the flowers, and if only I were strong enough to work for you as you have worked for me. And Mary kissed and comforted her. The next morning came, and Mary got up at break of day. She ran and looked into the water pail. Then she clapped her hands and called, Come, Alice, come! See the silver pennies shining at the bottom of the clear water? There must be a hundred of them. Come, sister dear. And Alice forgot that she could not move. She sprang lightly out of bed and ran into the kitchen. And she was all well and happy again. And oh, how glad the sisters were! How they kissed each other and laughed with joy! They milked the cow and churned and baked and cooked and sat spinning on the porch. And the bees buzzed, and the butterflies fluttered, and the sisters sang, How merrily the wheels go round with the whirring humming sound. End of chapter 33「Chapter 34 of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen – The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott
Chapter Thirty Four, The Brownie of Blednoch, from Scotland, Old Madge's Tale. Have you ever heard of the Brownie Eichendrum? No. Well, I will tell you how he came to Blednoch. It was in the autumn time. The red sun was setting when through our town he passed, crying, "Oh, so wearily!" Have you work for Eichendrum? Have you work for Eichendrum? He turled at the pin and entered in. I trow the boldest there stood back. You should have heard the children scream. The black dog barked. The lasses shrieked at the sight of Eichendrum. His matted head lay on his breast. A long blue beard fell to his waist. Around his hairy form was wrapped a cloth of woven rushes green. His long, thin arms trailed on the ground. His hands were claws. His feet had no toes. Oh, fearful to see was Eichendrum! And all the time he cried so wearily, so drearily, "Have you work for Eichendrum? Have you work for Eichendrum?" Then the brave goodman stood forth and said, "What would ye? Whence come ye by land or sea?" Then what a groan gave Eichendrum! I come from a land where I never saw the sky, but now I'll bide with ye if ye have work for Eichendrum. I'll watch your sheep and tend your kine each night till day. I'll thresh your grain by the light of the moon. I'll sing strange songs to your bonny bairns if ye'll but keep poor Eichendrum. I'll churn the cream. I'll knead the bread. I'll tame the wildest colts ye have if ye'll but keep poor Eichendrum. No clothes nor gold is wage for me. A bowl of porridge on the warm hearthstone is wage enough for Eichendrum. The brownie speaks well," said the old housewife. "Our workers are scarce. We have much to do. Let us try this Eichendrum. Then should you have seen the brownie work. By night he swept the kitchen clean. He scoured the pots until they shone. By the light of the moon he threshed the grain. He gathered the crops into the barn. He watched the sheep and tended the kine. By day he played with the bonny bairns, and sang them strange songs of the land without sky. So passed the months away, and all farm things throve for the good man and the old housewife. But when the cold night winds blew hard, a lass who saw the brownie's clothes woven all of rushes green, made him a suit of sheep's wool warm. She placed it by his porridge bowl, and that night was heard a wailing cry so weary and so dreary. Long, long may I now weep and groan. Wages of clothes are now my own. O、oh, luckless Eichendrum! And down the street and through the town, his voice came back upon the wind. Farewell to Blednoch, farewell, farewell. And never again in all that land was seen the brownie Eichendrum. End of chapter thirty-four. Chapter Number Thirty Five of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of Elves and Fairies. For storytelling and reading aloud, by Francis Jenkins Olcott, Elsa and the Ten Elves from Sweden. Once upon a time, a little girl named Elsa lived on a farm. She was pretty, sweet-tempered, and generous, but she did not like to work. Her father was very proud of her and sent her to school in the city. She learned to read, write. Sing and dance, but still she did not know how to cook, sew, or care for a house. When she grew older, she was so good and beautiful that many young men wished her for a wife. But she said no to all except her neighbor, Gunner, a handsome, industrious young farmer. Soon they were married and went to live on his farm. At first, all was happiness, but as the days passed and Elsa did not direct the servants or look after the house, everything went wrong. The storerooms were in disorder, the food was stolen, 
and the house dirty. Poor Gunner was at his wit's end. He loved Elsa too much to scold her. The day before Christmas came, the sun had been up for a long time, and still Elsa lay in bed. A servant ran into her room, saying, Dear mistress, shall we get ready the men's luncheon so that they may go to the woods? Leave the room, said Elsa sleepily, and do not waken me again. Another servant came running in. Dear mistress, she cried, the leaven is working, and if you come quickly the bread will be better than usual. I want candlesticks, dear mistress, called a third. And what meat shall we roast for tomorrow's feast? shouted a fourth. And so it was. Servant after servant came running into the room, asking for orders. But Elsa would neither answer nor get up. Last of all came Gunner, impatient because his men had not yet started for the woods. Dear Elsa, he said gently my mother used to prepare things the night before so that the servants might begin work early we are now going to the woods and shall not be back until night remember there are a few yards of cloth on the loom waiting to be woven then gunner went away as soon as he was gone elsa got up in a rage and dressed herself ran through the kitchen to the little house where the loom was kept she slammed the door behind her and threw herself down on a couch no she screamed i won't i won't endure this drudgery any more who would have thought that gunner would make a servant of me and wear my life out with work oh me oh me is there no one from far or near to help me i can said a deep voice and elsa raising her head with fright saw standing close to her an old man wrapped in a gray cloak and wearing a broad-brimmed hat i am old man hoberg he said and have served your family for many generations you my child are unhappy because you are idle to love work is a joy i will now give you ten obedient servants who shall do all your tasks for you he shook his cloak and out of its folds tumbled ten funny little men they capered and pranced about making faces then they swiftly put the room in order and finished weaving the cloth on the loom after all was done they ran and stood in an obedient row before elsa dear child reach hither your hands said the old man and elsa trembling gave him the tips of her fingers then he said hop o oh my thumb lick the pot long pole heart in hand little peter funny man away all you to your places and in the twinkling of an eye the little men vanished into elsa's fingers and the old man disappeared elsa could hardly believe what had happened and sat staring at her hands suddenly a wonderful desire to work came over her she could sit still no longer why am i idling here cried she cheerfully it is late in the morning and the house is not in order the servants are waiting and up she jumped and hastened into the kitchen and was soon giving orders and singing while she prepared the dinner and when gunner came home that night all was clean and bright to welcome him and the smell of good things to eat filled the house and after that day elsa rose early each morning and went about her work sweet-tempered and happy no one was more pleased and proud than she to see how the work of the farmhouse prospered under her hands and health 
wealth and happiness came and stayed with elsa and gunner end of chapter thirty five recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter thirty six of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud by francis jenkins olcott pisky fine and pisky gay cornish tis told in the west country how the pisky threshed the corn and did other odd jobs for farmer boslow as long as the old man lived and after his death the pisky worked for his widow and this is how she lost the little fellow one night when the hills were covered with snow and the wind was blowing hard the widow boslow left in the barn for pisky a larger bowl than usual full of milk thickened with oatmeal it was clear moonlight and she stopped outside the door and peeped in to see if pisky would come to eat his supper while it was hot the moonlight shone through a little window on the barn floor and there sitting on a sheaf of oats she saw the pisky greedily eating his thickened milk he soon emptied the bowl and scraped it as clean with the wooden spoon as if it had been washed then he placed them both in a corner and stood up and patted and stroked his stomach and smacked his lips as if to say that's good of the old dear see if i don't thresh well for her tonight but when the pisky turned around the widow saw that he had nothing on but rags and very few of them how poor pisky must suffer thought she he has to pass most of his time among the rushes in the boggy moor and his legs are naked and his breeches are full of holes i'll make the poor fellow a good warm suit of the homespun at once no sooner though than she went home and began the suit in a day or two she had made a coat and breeches and knitted a long pair of sheep's wool stockings with garters and a nightcap all nicely knitted too when at night came the widow placed the pisky's new clothes and a big bowl of thickened milk on the barn floor just where the moonlight fell brightest then she went outside and peeped through the door soon she saw pisky eating his supper and squinting at his new clothes laying down his empty bowl he took the things and put them over his rags then he began capering and jumping around the barn singing pisky fine and pisky gay pisky now will run away and sure enough he bolted out of the door and passed the window without as much as i wish you well till i see you again and he never came back to the farm end of chapter thirty six Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 37 of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott The Fairy Wedding, Swedish Once upon a time there was a lovely young girl, daughter of rich parents, who was known for her gentleness and goodness. One night, while she was lying awake in her bed, watching the moonbeams dance on the floor her door was softly opened 
then in tripped a little fairy man clad in a gray jacket and a red cap he came lightly towards her bed nodding in a most friendly way do not be afraid dear lady he said i have come to ask a favor of you and i will do it willingly if i can answered the girl who had begun to recover from her fright oh it will not be difficult said the fairy man for many years i and mine have lived under the floor of your kitchen just where the water cask stands but the cask has become old and leaky so that we are continually annoyed by the dripping of water our home is never dry that shall be seen to in the morning said the girl thank you dear lady said the fairy man and making an elegant bow he disappeared as softly as he had come the next day at the girl's request her parents had the water cask removed and after that to the surprise of the servants the kitchen work was done at night when all slept and never a pitcher or glass was broken in the house from that day forth so the fairies showed their gratitude well a few months after this the pretty young girl was again lying awake in her bed watching the moonbeams dance on the floor when again her door was opened softly and the fairy man stole in dear lady said he smiling and bowing now i have another request to make which in your kindness you will surely not refuse to grant what is it asked she well your honor me and my house to-night he replied and stand at the christening of my newly born daughter the girl arose and dressing herself followed the fairy man through many passages and rooms that she had never known existed at last they entered a small but elegant apartment in which a host of fairies were assembled they immediately christened the fairy baby and as the little man was about to conduct the girl again to her room the fairies filled her pockets with what looked like shavings the little man then led her back through the same winding passages and as soon as she was safely in her room he said if we should meet at another time you must never laugh at me and mine we love you for your goodness and modesty but if you laugh at us you and i shall never see each other again when he was gone the girl threw all the shavings into the fireplace and lay down and went to sleep and lo the next morning when the maid came in to build the fire she found in the ashes the most beautiful jewelry of all pure gold set with gems and of the finest workmanship now it happened some time after this that the girl's wedding day arrived there was great bustling and preparations for a splendid feast at length the wedding hour came the bride beautifully dressed and wearing her fairy jewels and a crown on her golden hair was conducted to the hall where the guests were waiting during the ceremony she chanced to glance around the hall she saw near the fireplace all her friends the fairies gathered for a wedding feast the bridegroom was a little elf and the bride was her goddaughter and the feast was spread on a golden table no one but the girl could see the fairies just at that moment one of the elves who was acting as a waiter at the fairy bridal stumbled over a twig that lay on the floor and fell forgetting the caution that the little man had given her the girl burst into a hearty laugh instantly the golden table the elfin bridegroom and bride and all the fairy guests vanished and from that day to this no work was ever done at night in that kitchen nor were any fairies ever seen about that house End of chapter 37 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.
Chapter number thirty eight of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott The Tomps, Swedish Every child knows, or ought to know, if he does not know, that a tomp is a queer little elfin man, old and wizen, and clad in grey clothes and red cap. He lives in the pantry or in the barn. At night he washes the dishes and sweeps the kitchen floor, or threshes the farmer's corn and looks after his sheep. Oh, the taunt is a very friendly elf, but his feelings are easily hurt, and if any one is impolite to him, he runs away and is never seen again. Now it happened, once upon a time, that there was a farmer whose crops and flocks and herds prosper so well that all knew he was aided by a taunt. In fact, he became the richest farmer in his neighborhood. Although he had few servants, his house was always in order, and his grain nicely threshed, but he never saw the elf who did all these things for him. One night he decided to watch and see who worked in his barn. He hid behind a door. By and by he saw not one taunt, but a multitude of tomps come into the barn. Each carried a stalk of rye, but the littlest tomp of all, not bigger than a thumb, puffed and breathed very hard, although he carried but a straw on his shoulder. "'Why do you puff so hard?' cried the farmer from his hiding place. "'Your burden is not so great.' "'His burden is according to his strength.' for he is but one night old answered one of the tomps hereafter you shall have less and with that all the little men vanished and the grain lay unthreshed on the barn floor and from that day all luck disappeared from the farmer's house and he was soon reduced to beggary end of chapter thirty eight Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 39 of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott. Song of the Elfin Miller. Full merrily rings the millstone round, full merrily rings the wheel, full merrily gushes out the grist. Come taste my fragrant meal as sends the lift its snowy drift so the meal comes in a shower work fairies fast for time flies past i borrowed the mill an hour the miller's he's a worldly man and mon hey double fee so draw the sluice of the churl's dam and let the stream come free shout fairies shout see gushing out the meal comes like a river the top of the grain on hill and plain is ours and shall be ever one elf goes chasing the wild bat's wing and one the white owl's horn one hunts the fox for the white o oh, his tail and we winna hay him till morn one idle fay with the glow-worm's ray runs glimmering mong the mosses Another goes tramp we the will o wisp lamp to light a lad to the lasses. O oh, haste, my brown elf, bring me corn, 
from bonnie blackwood plains go gentle fairy bring me grain from green dalgona mains but pride of a close burn ha fair is the corn and fatter taste fairies taste a gallanter grist has never been wet with water hilloa my hopper is heaped high hark to the well-hung wheels they sing for joy the dusty roof it clatters and it reels haste elves and turn yon mountain burn bring streams that shine like siller the dam is down the moon sinks soon and i maun grind my miller how bravely done my wanton elves that is a foaming stream see how the dust from the mill flies and chokes the cold moonbeam haste fairies fleet come baptized feet come sack and sweep up clean and meet me soon ere sinks the moon in thy green vale dalreen ellen cummingham end of chapter thirty nine recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter number forty of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by francis jenkins olcott phase of water wood and meadow over hill over dale through bush through briar over park over pale through flood through fire i do wander everywhere swifter than the moon's sphere and i serve the fairy queen to do her orbs upon the green the cowslips tall her pensioners be in their gold coats spots you see those be rubies fairy favors in those freckles live their saviors i must go seek some dewdrops here and hang a pearl in every cowslip's ear shakespeare end of chapter forty Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.